Hello everyone and welcome to the uh, director's seminar for the Institute for Global Prosperity. I'm Professor Henrietta Moore and I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Global Prosperity. And it's my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jane Davidson. Dr. Davidson is Pro Vice Chancellor Emerita at the University of Wales Trinity St. David. She was Minister for Education, then Minister for Environment and Sustainability in the Welsh Government, where she proposed legislation to make sustainability the central organising principle of legislation. She proposed also the famous Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which came into law in 2015. And she first introduced the very first plastic bag charge in the UK, and her recycling vision took Wales to third best in the world for plastic recycling. She's an author and environmental activist, and she's written a brilliant book called Future Gen, Lessons from a Small Country, which is all about why she and Wales have been so successful. So Jane, welcome this afternoon to the IGP. Thank you very much for coming and talking to us. Um, we're very much looking forward uh, to hearing about Wales and all that you have done, both for Wales and for the UK. Um, and so let me offer you the floor, please. Henrietta, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much for the very warm welcome and, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about Wales's journey, uh, both up to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and subsequently. Um, and perhaps although uh, you're very kind to talk about uh, success. And I think at the moment, if you look at policy being made in Wales, you can see the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act influencing every aspect of policy in every government portfolio. But I think that the journey has been a long and hard one. <laughs> and therefore, I hope that uh, people in this room will find something in, in the story of Wales to also uh, perhaps reflect on their own story in their own countries in terms of how we can pivot, how we can change the narrative uh, and how we can actually think differently about what, what is the purpose of government, why, where and who and how should we be looking after the interests of future generations. Perhaps if I can start just with a picture of one of those future generations. I have to say it's a picture I really rather like um, with the idea that we should pass on to future generations and save something for them. And this is actually in itself, that is almost like a radically um, different narrative about what we currently do to future generations. We do talk about educating the current generations in a way that is fit for purpose. But we still, for example, we put nuclear waste down to future generations. Um, so for that, they can deal with that in due course. Government debts are passed down to future generations. You'll, in this call particularly, be acutely aware that many aspects of um, student debt is effectively passed down to future generations with current predictions that potentially up to 75% of students will not be paying their full debt back. So we are storing up a set of problems. And if we then think about the work that's gone on over the last year or so, that has identified that potentially uh, my children are the poorest generation ever in the sense that they will be the first generation to be poorer than their parents. Now, as a parent and as a grandparent, that is really not the legacy I want to leave to my children. And I was delighted um, about this time last year when I was asked to write a book about the experiment that Wales undertook in terms of looking at issues around how to protect future generations in all its policy thinking. I also want to just throw out there at the beginning um, my belief about what a government is for. And there's a lot of debate about this issue. There's always been a lot of debate about this issue. But in a sense, if you were going to be really um, simplistic and binary, government is around safety. But those safety needs 
can either be about what keeps the population safe, as in a fortress approach, how you build up the arsenal to protect your country against all comers, or about what keeps the population safe in the intrinsic needs that keep humans alive. And my politics and my um, thought about the purpose of government has always tended towards the latter. So if we look back, for example, at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll all be familiar with it. It's 1943, interesting timing in the context of the uh, Second World War. And looking at what are the essentials to keep humans alive? What are the essentials to enable them to engage appropriately in society? And what are the essentials in terms of them lifting their ambition? And if we just look at the bottom, uh, of that slide in terms of physiological needs. Government has a really important role. Oddly enough, in all of them, although I used to say that it's very clear in terms of air, we don't get clean air unless government takes action to keep clear, uh, air clean. We don't get water unless government takes action to facilitate access to water. And of course, that's particularly difficult in drought ridden countries. In many cases, how and what we access in food is in the control of government. And if we just think about the awful rise of food banks in the last year, we'll know that what level of benefit enables a family to live in a country becomes very important in terms of the survival and welfare of children. We don't have sufficient housing in the UK at the moment, and shelter obviously is the ultimate in the context of stability and particularly shelter that people can feel safe in. So all those aspects, air, water, food, shelter, are the proper domain of government. And governments have always taken responsibility. Whether they've acted responsibly is a different matter in that context. But then even when you look at those other areas, you know, in terms of clothing or reproduction, um, some of you will have seen uh, the uh, academic study that was out about 10 days ago, demonstrating that by 2045, the fertility of humanity is at risk. I mean, that is an, excess, an existential crisis that people understand on a different level, perhaps, to the crisis of climate change. But all these elements and how we deal with them are in control of the government. And in terms of whether or not we have that personal security, employment resources, whether or not we're able to engage in a sense of connection in community, whether or not we have self-esteem, respect, status, etc. All of these things that we see as necessary to contribute to becoming the person that we can be, the best person, the best version of us that we can be, are actually like ladders to climb. And if we have not had the needs met, at the physiological level, if government has failed to meet the needs of its population, then actually that, lad that ladder becomes insurmountable. And we have more people now in the UK with physiological needs that are not met by government than I think we've had in my lifetime. I want to just talk about intergovernmental engagement for a moment as well, because government is obviously at the single state level and that, that single state can be in the context of Wales, obviously a devolved nation, but broadly government is looked at in the context of, for example, UN member states. And what really interests me about this Rio declaration at the First Earth Summit in 1992 is not that fundamental proposition that humans are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature, as the fact that if we don't have a life in harmony with nature, since we are part of nature's systems, then of course that way leads to disaster. And that's a really important thing to remember. And when we look back also at 1992, we saw a proliferation of activities across the world in that decade that focused on issues around sustainable development. And that was part of that big agenda where people were encouraged 
to think global and act local. And I was particularly reminded of this um, science on a sphere, uh, which was in the London Science Museum back in the 90s, uh, the other day, because when I saw it then, I was um, absolutely amazed by the ability of a computer, which shows just so, so far we've moved since then. Absolutely amazed at the ability of a computer to actually demonstrate the proliferation of whatever it is. And what was really useful about science on a sphere um, in, the, in the demonstration I saw was the fact that it could show you what flooding would look like and what predicted flooding would look like. And of course, when you start looking at that, you find that the country boundaries break down. So if we don't think global when we act local, we take actions that detrimentally affect people in other parts of the world. And I think the most important one I saw was actually the spread of flu and the spread of other uh, diseases or infections, just showing that at the time, the number of diseases and infections and their spread was always linked across countries to access to healthcare, which is something in the gift of government, to access to clean water, to access to quality food, to access to education and others. So you could immediately see links to ill health that were linked to the natural environment as well. So these things are all integrated and therefore we have to apply systems thinking in the context of how we're going to tackle them. Now, I came in as a um, one of the first politicians in the new National Assembly for Wales in 1999. And what is absolutely fascinating about, um, about the Government of Wales Act, uh, which uh, gave the National Assembly its initial authority, was that it did something different to any other part of the UK, but has been very important in the narrative that has developed in Wales. It gave Wales uniquely a duty to promote sustainable development and the exercise of its functions. And a, a number of elements came together to enable that to happen. There was a Secretary of State who was a keen RSPB member. Uh, there was civil society in Wales that was very active and very um, visionary about what they wanted the new National Assembly to achieve. A very strong environmental lobby. A number of strong parliamentarians from Wales uh, who were, of course, then most influential in adding uh, this particular clause. But that meant that Wales started with a position that was not there in either Scotland or Northern Ireland. No such duty around sustainable development was given to those new legislatures, even though all the UN members had signed up to that duty in the Earth Summit in 1992. And I think just hold that in your minds for a moment, how you can sign up to something in an Earth Summit and then not deliver it in legislation. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And we chose, uh, in one sense, one could say, obviously, to adopt the Brundtland definition of sustainable development, the most commonly used um, definition of sustainable development in the world. And we felt that it did encompass the um, ambition of the new institution uh, by having development that met the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And the point about having such a definition is it was the beginning of creating a narrative framework around values for the new institution. Although the new institution in Wales had very, very few powers, which is why it was an assembly, whereas Scotland was a parliament. Um, although some people on the call will probably realise that uh, as of um, uh, the last government of Wales Act, Wales is now a parliament uh, with its own Welsh name, the Senedd. Oh, just going back one moment as well. I'm framing this presentation as I've framed um, um, my book, uh, Future Gen, we'll come back to that a bit later, um, uh, on some of the elements of vision of Donella Meadows. And the reason I'm using Donella Meadows, who apart from being the most wonderful feminist systems thinker and who writes in terms that somebody like me as a layperson can easily understand, is because she wrote a very, very Im 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 important um, book in the 1970s called Limits to Growth, which I hope that some of you will have already read. And um, in that book, 
she highlighted that governments had the evidence available to them that world had environmental limits. And she believed that when they knew the actions that they were taking that were actually compromising the ability of humanity to survive for the long term, she was convinced as a scientist that governments would act. Came in the year uh, 2003 to redefine or relook at that agenda 30 years on. So that's the limits um, to grow 30 years on. She decided that that was not the case. And it's obviously evidentially not the case that evidence was not enough, that there were some softer elements that you had to persuade people with. And these softer elements I'm going to be using uh, throughout these slides and they, they, they form the chapters in my book as well. How do you get people onto the page in terms of actually looking at changing uh, the way that you take decisions, the way, the way that you exercise your responsibilities? And I think in, in the context of this one, um, it's just amazing um, how when she talks about visioning, taking off the constraints of feasibility, of disbelief, of past disappointments, and letting your mind dwell upon its most noble, uplifting, treasured dreams. Now, I love that mixture of a very, very strong evidence-based scientist understanding what is important about enabling people to share the vision. So the vision for the new National Assembly for Wales was that it would promote sustainable development in everything that it did. And in fact, it, in doing so, it spent a long time trying to achieve that. And there were three ministers, I was the third of whom tried to exercise our responsibilities under the scheme that we were set to deliver. A scheme that for each administration, we'd lay out how we were going to take this duty forward. And I had that duty from 2007 to 2011. And previously, uh, what the first minister tried for an overarching vision, the second minister um, decided to focus down with the help of Forum for the Future and the Sustainable Development Commission to focus down on some very specific outcomes so that people could really see the value of this thinking. By the time I came along in 2007, it was clear that however much we were doing, not only were we not doing enough, but we were not delivering any change that would mean if you looked at Wales compared to any other country, you would see a different way of operation. So I was charged with the responsibility of our first minister, the, uh, the prime minister of Wales, to put this at the heart of government, to create a framework um, and then he gave me the authority to bring a proposal to the cabinet uh, to put sustainable development as the central organizing principle of government. And I did that. And that was creating a document called One Wales, One Planet, if people are interested looking at the backstory. And everybody signed up to it. The cabinet of two political parties, Labour and Plaid Cymru, total sign up strong support from a number of assembly members, strong support, very strong support from the hierarchy, so uh, in terms of the environmental organizations, those people who were very much talking to government, very strong support from civil society generally. We did a huge consultation uh, in terms of the, of the kind of whales that we wanted to create together and everything that came back um, delivered on the idea that one Wales, one planet was something that we could really take forward in Wales. But by the end of my time in government, I realised that we may have done that. We may have political buy-in. We may notionally have civil service buy-in. We may have buy-in from the external sectors. We may be supported by the Sustainable Development Commission and others, but it was not delivering an absolute change in the context of how we delivered on decision making and how we had a values framework that underpinned everything we did. And partly that was for two reasons. The first one was that because the duty to promote had nothing else in the clause, how do you promote? What constitutes promoting? What does promoting look like? Why should you um, deliver if you only have to promote? 
And I found out in 2010 that at no point ever had we failed in our duty to promote. And that was a report from the Wales Audit Office, which made me very sad because if we'd not, if we'd never failed in our duty to promote, but we were not delivering government differently, then actually we needed to move to a duty to deliver. And that is the, uh, is the core element that actually drove forward my proposal uh, for a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But there was another event as well, and these events are very important in politics. And when you seize the time to do something, when the um, coalition government came in in 2010, literally overnight, the Sustainable Development Commission, which was a group of 12, I think it was, commissioners from all over the world, non-partisan in any way, experts in their field, who worked collaboratively to advise governments of all different political considerations. They were removed overnight um, on the basis that in that election, uh, the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition, you could not set up a new non-departmental public body unless an old one went. And I think they were always a, a hazard of that commitment um, to the people in the, in, in, in the manifesto. But the point was that this immense resource that had been there for all of us for 10 years and had been, had been utilized by all administrations in the UK literally went overnight and was not protected. And there was a sort of irony to me that you could end up in a situation where the very body charged to help people was removed at a time that people most needed help. And it was those two things together that actually meant that I proposed into the manifesto in Wales in March of 2011, that we should have uh, a sustainable development bill. It was called at the time to move the duty to promote to a duty to deliver. And what was really important in terms of moving towards that was actually once again, going back to the people of Wales. Because if you're going to do something in a democracy that is very different to the normal foundations of democracy, you need a consensus around it. And we were delighted that just as when we'd been out uh, to consultation before from government around the One Wales, One Planet agenda, this one, which was not done by government, it was conducted by civil society through all the millions of people involved in the organisations uh, that civil society supports in Wales. And they did a Wales We Want um, a consultation that reflected what the UN was doing on the world we want in the context of coming up to the sustainable development goals. And what was very clear from the people of Wales is that exactly the same kind of agenda, strong community-based, equal, tackling poverty, uh, tackling things like poor housing, um, contributing much more effectively to the environment, tackling climate change. All of these were strong responses from the people of Wales in terms of how we move forward. So that networking, that web of connections among equals held together not by force, obligation, material incentive or social contract, but by shared values. And those shared values was being the people of Wales. And that enabled us with confidence uh, to move forward onto the next steps. And here in, in short is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Often people talk about the pillars of sustainable development being environmental, social and economic, but this word cultural is critically important here because that's both about culture in the context of behaviour change and action, and also cultural in the context of identity and heritage of a country. And that will vary uh, in the context of, the of all countries that engage in this kind of agenda, as will all those other com components. The environmental issues will be different, the social, the economic issues will be different, but they're a very good way of underpinning a legislative approach. There are seven interlinked goals. And the goals are there in front of you at the moment. But I think what's really interesting about them is that they are now in law. This is not goals outside the law. The law describes the goals. 
So if you just look at the headline in terms of a prosperous Wales, an innovative, productive and low carbon society, which recognises the limits of the global environment. It also, a little later, talks about people taking advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work. And you'll uh, have, hope be pleased to know that actually the real living wage has become the absolute test of that in Wales. Every education institution in Wales pays the real living wage for example. If we talk about a resilient Wales, not just maintaining but enhancing a biodiverse natural environment. A healthier Wales is looking at maximising people's physical and mental well-being and understanding choices and behaviour. So these are upstream views of what normally are dealt with as downstream reactive short-term issues. Uh, if you look at equality, it's about socio-economic as well as all other uh, of the protected characteristics. And ultimately, it's how we create attractive, viable, safe and well-connected communities in Wales that promotes and protects the culture, heritage and language and enables Wales as a country to be globally responsible. And in a sense, there's, I mean, that's a very, very positive goal in so many ways in the context of wanting to have a positive influence on the world. But part of that positive influence is not offshoring Wales's emissions. So if we think about fracking, not happening in Wales, coal, not happening in Wales, uh, for example, you can start to see that there are real opportunities in having a value system that actually lays out what you want to achieve in broad terms so that you then can use your policies and legislation to fill in the detail. Importantly also in the legislation is uh, or are the five ways of working. So thinking long term, preventatively integrating outcomes, collaborating with each other, involving people about whom decisions are being made. In fact, you'll see in terms of OECD recommendations about decision making, there are some common elements. So for me, in many ways, this was all about how you make good decisions because you create a context that you want to support in how and when and where you make your decisions. And importantly, they do link directly over to the sustainable development goals. And what's interesting about this is that not only is Wales the first country in the world, the first country in the world to have legislation to protect future generations, it is still the only country in the world, six years later, to have legislation to protect future generations. And despite the fact that 193 countries signed up to the sustainable development goals, Wales is the only country in the world and not a UN member state that actually has a legislative framework in place that can that can deliver on the sustainable development goals. So there's a huge issue here about at what level you can achieve outcomes and you can influence change. And it's the sort of thing that would make you feel a little less confident about whether or not we will get the kind of achievements of the big, big global conferences on climate change. Uh, or biodiversity or anything else when we weren't yet or haven't yet had the agreement in terms of legislative frameworks around the sustainable development goals. Another very important input from Donella is the point that you have to talk about the successes and the failures of the present and the potentials and obstacles in the future. Um, I think that broadly the act is successful in the sense that it is absolutely changing the narrative in Wales. And just as anything else, when you start slowly, but then you pick up speed, we can see that, you know, in the year following the act being passed, nothing happened because the act wasn't commenced until 2016. There was a lot of heart searching going on between 2016 and 18, as all the public bodies required to deliver on the act had to create well-being plans, both individually and collectively in their areas. And plans were not very ambitious. What is in really interesting now is that actually, I think that every single public organization in 2021 would look back on those plans and be much more ambitious about their next set, because now there is a momentum behind taking decisions that deliver on the objectives of the Act. 
And there, and that point about having the courage to admit and bear the pain of the present while keeping a steady eye on a vision of a better future is a huge one because when you've been the first country in the world to pass legislation and then people are looking to you to lead and you're almost in shell shock or you know in the headlights like an animal in the headlights of the world without having a major narrative to on delivery then it's very concerning and in many ways you can say well why would people follow that lead if it looks like a rhetorical lead rather than a real lead but when and maybe we'll pick up this in the in in the conversation when now if you look at the future generations commissioner's report if you look at the auditor general for wales uh, if you look at welsh government in terms of actions taken over the last year you will suddenly see that actually all the actions are part of that narrative and there were many actions before that were also part of that narrative, particularly in the fields of recycling and environment. And just a, a, a small side story, but part of the reason that um, I entered into these fairly draconian recycling statutory targets with pretty dramatic penalties uh, in uh, 2010 when we passed the legislation, was because one of the very first things that happened to me in 2007, when I first became a minister, was that the planning, the lead planning officer came to me and asked me to rule on which communities in Wales should have new landfill sites. And I just thought I didn't want any communities in Wales to have new landfill sites because I wouldn't want one next to me. And therefore, why should anyone have to have new landfill sites when we had ways of dealing with the issues? And I'm delighted to tell you that in the circular economy strategy published uh, two days ago in, in Wales, that now low, municipal input to lab, landfill is down to 8% and will be nothing by 2025. So in the period of time of moving up the waste hierarchy from introducing re strong recycling legislation in 2010 to 2021, landfill is being removed from the system in Wales. It's taken 10 years, but any country could do that in 10 years. And with the learning on the way, could possibly do that in half the time. So it's the kind of learning and how that can be utilized for the future that I'm really interested in. But I also did find um, when I uh, scrutinized the development of the Act since uh, 2011 to 15 in terms of the navigation of the uh, process of it, and then from 2015 onwards in terms of the delivery on it, I did find a number of key learnings, and you'll see these on, on this slide. I really was interested in Donella's um, statement about exploring new paths with vigour and courage being open to other people's exploration of other paths and being willing to switch paths if one is found that leads more directly to the goal. And I, with, with some sense of apology, I can say that having spent so long in government and then um, as a you know, pro vice chancellor uh, in a university, I was very top down in my thinking when I started writing the book, very top down in thinking who is most influential and how are decisions made in the most influential way. And in the book, I wrote these five elements of learning, but I wish I had written, the act needs to become a people's act as number one, because it is, you know, if we're in a democratic environment, if the people embrace a big vision, they will then challenge their government to deliver on them on it. They will challenge their public services to deliver on it. So the way this act will become most successful is if it becomes a people's act in Wales. Yes, government, the public, yes, they need to create the right support and financial mechanisms. And yes, we need to learn from others. But I should also have put the second one is nature has rights too. Because we know that in Wales, actually the poor practice in the context of nature has meant that from the Climate Change Commission's perspective, Wales would take five years longer 
to reach the right outcomes in the context of its agricultural system. But in fact, because Wales is much smaller, that could be done much, much quicker if people were minded to actually take that challenge on. So I'm still learning from my learning, which, <laughs> which and we should never stop learning, should we? And then the final element from Donella is this notion of loving, that the sustainability revolution will have to be above all a collective transformation that permits the best of human nature rather than the worst to be expressed and nurtured. And one of the things I, I read in, um, uh, in one of Donella's books, and I've, I've read subsequently, is that in a sense, it's almost the difference in definition of a pessimist and an optimist. You know, an optimist believes the best of people and a pessimist uh, often believes the worst of people. And you just have a, uh, for me, it's not about sappy optimism, something else Donella says, but actually we have all the tools um, at our command at the moment. Paul Allen from the Centre for Alternative Technology wrote Zero Carbon Britain, which is how Britain can reach zero carbon with all the technologies we currently have available. And it's all about governance and government and how decisions are made and collective responsibility. And what I've laid out below that is, um, uh, you know, very, I think a very important um, narrative from Donella. And this was back in Limits for Growth. This was in the 1970s, she was telling us that if we think the world has no limits, extractive industries will extract, the result will be collapse. And we see that all the time. And we still see countries wanting to extract the last bit of X before they, they, they go on to the good side. And it, therefore we really are, for a lot of people in that territory of the limits are real, but there's not enough time. And therefore they do that extraction, even if though they know that that extraction may cause further problems and the result is still collapse. But if we think the limits are real and close, and of course they're a lot closer now, they're 50 years closer now than they were when Donella wrote this. So there is no time to waste. And I do believe there is just enough energy, enough material, enough money, enough environmental resilience, enough human virtue to bring about a planned reduction in the ecological footprint of humankind, a sustainability revolution to a much better world for the last, last majority. And I just think it's important to say one other thing about this as well. Um, there you see uh, a bit of my daily life. Of course, it's very Instagram pics of my daily life. Uh, a lot of it is trudging around in wellies, getting up early in the morning to deal with uh, uh, the animals. Um, but essentially, if you're focusing on a sustainability agenda, you do also have to live by it. Because what is absolutely clear, particularly in the, in, in, in the tabloid press, is that anybody um, who actually pre pre professes to support sustainability and has taken a holiday abroad or flown without needing to um, in, the, in the tabloid's eyes is immediately held up as a poor example. Now, I don't subscribe to that, I have to say. There are plenty of reasons by which people have to take actions. But I think that we should always be making sure that whatever action we take, if it is a negative one, we also compensate positively for it. And in doing so, we create a very, very important narrative that we don't ask people to live their lives like a hair shirt, but we ask people to make decisions, understanding the consequences of their decisions. So I may now be leaving actually a carbon positive life, in the sense that we uh, create more energy than we use and we have a renewable energy provider um, uh, and we have a ground source heat pump and we get our hot water from solar thermal um, etc but my I'm also acutely aware that I have been able to do that over a period of 10 years and that it is still more expensive than the alternatives 
So we also have to think about how to make the alternatives more expensive so that actually the natural choice, the responsible choice and the cheaper choice become the ways in which we can secure our and our children's futures. And if you're interested at the moment, there is a campaign called Today for Tomorrow uh, being run by Lord John Bird and Caroline Lucas MP to bring us a, a, a similar piece of legislation, not the same, because it's about a larger country or potentially to have an overarching approach across the UK, but fully understanding uh, the devolved government's role in that context. But I think it will be largely focused on England and is looking to be harder in the context of government in England, obviously having control over all sectors, whereas in Wales, Wales only has control, the Welsh government only has control over the public sector. And so even there, there are now major changes in procurement in Wales that mean that now there is a real opportunity for the collective might of the public sector to drive very different behaviour in the private sector uh, and in the voluntary sector in the context of using procurement mechanisms to do that linked to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So just to finish by um, a quote from John Rawls, Theory of Justice, American philosopher, do unto future generations what you would have had past generations do unto you. Thank you very much. Diochavar. Wonderful, Jane, thank you. And it's an amazing story, actually. It is truly inspiring. So before we open up to the floor, we have a few minutes for a conversation between you and me, which is the <laughs> standard thing that we do at the director seminar. So one question I wanted to start with um, is how important is it that Wales is a small country? And I ask that in, a, in, a, in genuinely, because I think about another country which I admire enormously in, in many ways, and that's Costa Rica. I mean, Costa Rica did something very good because it abolished its army in 1948 and hasn't had one since, right? So it's had lots of extra cash to do lots of other things um, and has had a similar kind of reforestation process and so on. I mean, it may not be as, it may not be squeaky clean and as perfect as we should all like, but there's something, is there something about being a small country that allows this to happen more quickly? I think I think that's absolutely the case, actually. Um, mm. but, but I don't think it's I think that the opportunity for small country is often to be a pilot. Mm -hmm. You said at the beginning that um, uh, I introduced the first carrier bag charge in the UK oh. mm. and therefore we did the work. We did the heavy lifting in Wales. Yeah. We did the testing of public opinion. Uh, you wouldn't. Um, uh, you'd be quite surprised to find out how many plastic bag manufacturers we had. <laughs> In the valleys in Wales, and of course that you know that really appalling, very much single-use um, plastic. Mm. So we had to, and we had to work with the local authorities and others. We had to define what the reward looked like. So we had to define the level of the charge, mm. all those things. Mm. And of course, um, I spent two years doing that. Mm. And within four years, every other part of the UK had followed. Yes. Um, and or slightly different because England initially didn't apply it across all the shops, um, whereas we did. Um, but just really interesting that therefore if somebody does the heavy lifting, uh, others can then look at how you adapt that into their own settings. And I think that's what that's why we called the book Lessons from a Small Country, because and yep. very much acknowledging that as a small country, you've got more flexibility because we didn't have powers over all aspects of our lives, it meant we could focus on where we could exercise our powers best. Mm. And that was obviously with those services that are in the direct control of government. So mm. public services directly controlled by government or partners such as local authorities and, 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 and others. Mm. But I think, and, and also that notion about where you get buy-in from communities too. Mm. Um, in, in the first year or so, um, I think people were very unclear as to what their agenda was going to be. And when people started realizing that this could be the absolute change maker for what they could do in their local communities, we have a project in Carmarthenshire at the moment, which is about 
using the public plate, the critical mass of mm. all the public authorities in Carmarthenshire uh, to drive new food production all the way from horticulture through the supply chain and restaurateurs and others. And that's really exciting, collective collaborative approaches that will actually change the opportunities for potential new growers, new, new food businesses in that area. And we've had interest in that from all over the world. I'm not surprised. I mean, I'm not surprised at all. I'm interested in it. I'm going to go and look it up right after we finish talking. <laughs> but also because, I mean, you know, I mean, France did something not quite as good as that. But they did say they made they passed some legislation a few years ago saying that any any government restaurant, by which they meant something like a like a hospital or a school where, where food is provided for you, would have to have a certain percentage of food from sourced locally. And, and, you know, over 50% organic. And that turned the local value chains around very, very rapidly in regions, very, yeah, very right. quickly. And then Copenhagen did it too. And, and interestingly enough, Copenhagen learned from France because there mm. were a lot of quibbles in France. There were, yes. <laughs> what constitutes local. Yes. And, um, and, and who, who's going to define the 50%? Yeah. But what Copenhagen did was they said, well, the one thing we can say is organic is good. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, the, Copenhagen do all their school meals organically. Yeah. And therefore, it's a simpler way of describing the issue and making it less contestable. Yeah. So I think that's also an important issue here. No, I think it is too. But what's so interesting, talking about learning, and you emphasise learning very much at the end, and I think we could all learn a huge amount from Wales, but what worries me is that, you know, I've just been on the advisory group for the Das Gupta Review on, on, on you know, biodiversity and so on, um, and, you know, the government has said that it's going to reply in, in good time, which is quite good for governments, as you know. Um, but the, the issue here, though, is, you know, just before that happened, you know, there was talk of a deep coal mine in Cumbria, although that's now whatever. We have all the UK banks are financing coal, not just here, but globally. So there is no, you know, there is a sense in which there's, there's, a, there's a missing element here of the control of finance. And I noticed you didn't talk very, well, I suppose it's what you had control over in Wales at the time, but I just wonder what your view about this sort of global financing is and where the banks and come into all of this. Well, I think I, I, th I think Henrietta, for me, it's about it's about moving the discussion upstream. Right. So, in a sense, you know, if because the Welsh government has taken the decision to um, use the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act not just as a law but as a values framework, mm -hmm. and of course, as a values framework, it applies to any government coming in in the context of the Welsh general election, uh, which started this week. Um, but what it has meant is that the, the Wales Development Bank, uh -huh. uh, which is there already, has to deliver according to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Yes, right. I see. Yeah. In, my, in my other role as chair of the Wales Inquiry of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, there, and their proposal for an agroecological bank, which yeah. is um, so getting a, a, a very positive response, I understand, from the UK government, you know, that would therefore fit absolutely with the Wales Development Bank. Yeah. So you're, if the narrative about the value system um, uh, is, is successful, it does oh. make everything change. And I think I just got a bit fed up of tinkering at the edge of systems, really, um, thinking about, well, how was I going to change this or how was I going to contribute towards changing that? So although many people will be aware of you know, individual things like the recycling targets or the Wales Coast Path or changing oh. the curriculum in schools or whatever, they were, they were all jigsaw pieces in a whole. But the, the act creates a whole that yeah. can be filled in in the context of the value system. And that is that is what's accelerated the narrative as well. Yeah, no, I can I can really see that and I appreciate it. And it's but one of the difficulties about change at scale and so on is the is the fact that we do have issues to do with what I call just transitions. So in, in so in Wales I have two sorts of things that I could give you as an example and you can say that this is not the case. So I'm not, don't be uh, unhappy if you do tell me I don't understand. But 
you know, one of the things is we have lots of parts of rural Wales. So when we talk about being carbon net zero, these are, these are communities that need transport. They still need to use cars. So unless we quickly make this transition for them, it's going to be a hard, hard, hard. So giving up cars if you live in central London might be fine, but elsewhere it isn't quite such an easy task. And then Welsh lamb, for example, which we all love, but is very much dependent on an export uh, value chain, presumably. So how do we deal with those things, which are, when they're, especially when they're important culturally as well? I mean, not well, cars, I think, but lamb. I think in, in terms of the first one, I think the car one is really interesting. Mm. There's, if you start to look at uh, if you look at cars through COVID, yes, machines sitting on streets, yeah, rusting, rusting, yes, or yeah. whatever, yeah. depending on the age, <laughs> but they've not been functional in our society. Yes, and even when people could start moving around again, mm. uh, of course, what we've also seen is massive active travel opportunities in cities. Mm. Now, I live in one of those areas of rural Wales mm. that you mentioned. And what excites me at the moment is the ability to car share for the future. Mm. And there's a very, very exciting um, little company called River Simple, um, mm. which encompasses the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act completely. And, and what River Simple is doing is it's it's um, it's creating uh, the world's first public market hydrogen car from mm -hmm. a rural location in Wales. Very right. beautiful car it is too because it's been um, designed by somebody who used to work in Formula One. <laughs> um, yeah. But also the model of the River Simple car is not you don't buy it you contract it like a mobile phone. Yeah, yeah. And suddenly you start to see that, you know, all those elements about make, do and mend, repair, uh, share, borrow, um, or contract for a period of time. Because how many of us need cars all the time? If we had a contracting system, um, then we are in a much, much better position uh, to both bring car use down dramatically and also then only use cars which do not contribute negatively to the environment. So yeah. I think, there are, and then if we think about the use of um, intelligent augmentation about how buses can, and that operates in Wales already, we have a, most of our buses around here are buses that you, you, you call online and they can come and pick you up. Uh, within a within a, a range of, uh, of of places, so that we obviously don't want people in deep rural places to be disenfranchised. But if there are mechanisms whereby they can call for support yes. that is still subsidised, mm. then actually the problem goes away. Yeah, no, no, I can see that. Yeah, and on your lamb point, um, I think the um, you know the, the if we move to an agroecological um uh environment and therefore farmed in the context of benefiting nature um mm. and in a benign way because it's the pesticide use and the slurry use in wales that's particularly poor and one of the last acts of the environment minister here was to take action on both of those mm. um uh, and therefore you know the there is a big wake-up call uh in the context of the next government about how then that will be delivered um, over, the next, over the next few years. But we do know that the common agricultural policies, which have meant that the headage of animals has been so great in the fields that they are completely overgrazed. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean to say, I mean, I'm not one of the advocates to say we have to take all meat out of our diet. No. We know that actually grazing and ruminant grazing in particular is really useful. Mm -hmm provided there is a proportionate number of animals to the grass that they're grazing. And right. grass is a fantastic carbon sequestration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when not um, uh, brought forward as a monolithic rye grass support. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think we should open up to the, to the, to the, to the floor now. Um, and um, so, uh, we have a lots of questions. Uh, so the first one is from um, Carol Bell, and she's saying to show how this is really happening in Wales, among the institutions on whose boards I serve, as well as guiding behaviours at the Development Bank of Wales and the National Museum of Wales, 
We're also now starting to use the act to define our strategy at the Football Association of Wales. Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> and so Carol will no doubt tell us at some point how that how that happens. But um, so coming to a real question, Jackie McGlade is saying, thank you, Jane, for a great description of the Welsh journey. I'm hoping that Wales can also be part of the well-being uh, gov economy group. Oh, it is already. Is yeah. it? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it is one of the um the five the five founder members um of the well-being. So it's, it's both part of the well-being economy alliance and part of WeGov, which is the well-being Econ economy government. Mm. And they've all pledged, I mean it's a really interesting initiative because they've all pledged to deliver on well-being budgets. Um so I'm I'm very excited by that. Yeah, that's very exciting. And she's mentioning something about the idea of an ombudsman for future generations, which is something that Hungary has. Is that is that such a well, position? We already, we already have that, which mm. is the generations commissioner. So right. when I outlined on a slide previously about um, the areas where um, uh, that the four areas uh, in in terms of uh, ensuring there is accountability under the legislation, so. Obviously, public services are accountable to Welsh government. Welsh government and public services are accountable to the commissioner mm. and future generations commissioner, who's immense resource, by the way, which is why I'll send the slides over. And um, mm. uh, if you let uh, uh, people have them, please, because sure. she's got lots of material on her site that's really useful. Um, and then also the courts. So yeah. there's very much multiple accountabilities in there. Mm. And, Future Generations Commissioner has a power of review in organisations. She can hold organisations to, to account and call them out, and she can make representations to both Parliament and ministers. Yes, well, that's good. That governance structure is a long, that's a long step from promote to deliver, isn't it? Because exactly. that's really important there, because without it, you know. Um, there's a question from Ed Dyson, and Ed's asking, what's next in Wales? I was surprised to see ploughing of upland pasture in Carmarthenshire. So people are incentives, uh, there's still something to do to bring people and incentives on side. What will the green recovery look like for Wales? Um, I think that I wouldn't be surprised, uh, even if I might be saddened by ploughing of upland pasture in Wales at the moment. Mm. Because in a sense, it's only since the act um, that the government has been looking to create different mechanisms. And I hope that whoever is in government um, in Wales post 6th of May, when our election is, mm -hmm. uh, will continue that agenda, in particular in the context of providing the, the support in terms of moving towards agroecological approaches. Yeah. Because, you know, when you overturn how many years, 50 years? of kind of engagement with the common agricultural policy. Um, when you overturn that length of time, mm. you don't expect to have the changes um, uh, immediately, but, they, but we need a just transition. Mm. And I think that if we actually were enabled to, to see a percentage of farms coming on each year and being supported through yeah. an agroecological approach, mm. that actually that's <clears throat> small country like Wales could really lead the way um, and therefore pick up the farms that are most keen to change at the beginning and using those as examples to others and then using finance to encourage that as well. Yeah. But you can imagine over a decade that Wales could, could work with its uh, farmers and new farmers to change that picture completely, which is really exciting opportunity in a small country. Yeah, no, that's really exciting. And then a question from Nikolai Minchev, who's saying, fantastic talk and congratulations on amazing work. You mentioned the tabloid media, which seemed to hold, whoops, Charlie's bouncing up the question here, sorry, which seemed to hold a tremendous amount of power in defining political opinions. And some of that media are very opposed to environmental initiatives and the people who promote them. So what do we do about this very neg negative press? How do we deal with people who, lots of people are still very anti, the environmental movement. yeah I think I, I think um I kind of I, you know I really I really get that and and in inter interesting enough as a minister it drives you absolutely bonkers yes on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> um, particularly in Wales where normally the only time the, the tabloid press come to Wales is to tell Wales off 
yes uh, doing whatever it's doing you know we locked down quicker well we're going to be told off for that we said non-essential items we're going to be told off for that etc uh, when wales's um vaccinations uh, are still i think actually you probably won't know this but they are with wales has vaccinated more of its population proportionately but we know that oh, in, okay. you never know that out so yes. <laughs> When Wales has the low, Wales has the lowest rate of infections in the yeah. UK at the moment. I mean, and um, and apart, mm. apart from a blip throughout the planet, you won't know that either. <laughs> so, so, in a sense, um, there are you know they are the they are the kind of evil of the modern world. Yeah. But also, what's been absolutely fascinating is actually both the Daily Mail and the Daily Express said that they were going to uh, they were going to encourage their readers to act positively on climate. Hmm. I think that every poll that has been taken of um, of all of all the generations shows that it's only the over 60s, I think, mm -hmm. still are pretty ambivalent as a as a group yes. in the context of climate. Every other generation understands the, the nature of the problem. And of course, the younger you are, the more important it is that we act on it. Yeah. So I think that there is there will be some movement. This is the irrepressible optimist in me. But I also think the other thing is just ignore them. Their <laughs> readers are tiny. Their yeah. readers are old. Oh. And actually all the news media that you can get via social media and different news platforms can give you much, much better information every oh. day of your life. And I wouldn't rely ever on a tabloid to give me information I could use again with confidence. And I think the really important element is going to be where do we get our trusted information from Yeah. Um, now? Because we know the conspiracy theories have led to people who have small sources of information acquisition, um, getting, you know, un uh, understanding the world in completely different ways. Mm. So how can there be, uh, so this is class question really to everybody on the call, mm. how can we create trusted information sources that means that the understanding of the necessity to act on climate becomes one that um, means that everybody takes the most action they can at the COP when it comes. Yeah, that's great. And we have a question from Stephen McConaughey who's saying really inspiring story, thank you. I'm really interested in the concept of time and the ways in which time figures in political and public life. Are there ways in which you're shifting the time horizons, both within institutions and within the public? So are there mechanisms in Wales, mechanisms Wales is using to encourage this longer term thinking? Well, that is such an interesting question. Right. Now, I think that the um, politics generally um, looks to, at the longest, the end of a life of administration. Mm. But really, it looks a lot shorter than that because it's looking to take actions where it can test the public mood in the context of um, making sure that people will be voted in the following occasion. Yeah, that in a, in a sense is the inherent problem uh, with politics generally. And what we saw in COVID was that this short timetable sometimes got shortened down so that you'd have two different decisions in one day oh. in the context of reaction. Uh, yeah. to particular issues and I think that you know my my proposition I, I feel really that I'm a one-trick pony because my one trick or my one proposition is simply we, we shouldn't be doing it like that mm. should we should be looking at it by trying to prevent those things happening so if we think about all the things that potentially are problematic whether it's climate change, whether it's, I said at the beginning, the dealing with nuclear waste, whether it's how we fund universities, all those issues, mm. we should be looking not to colonize the futures of people not yet born yet in mm. the context of the debt, the problem to deal with. And I think actually um, Roman Kishnarek um, uh, has looks at this very well in his book, The Good oh, Ancestor. Good ancestor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because what, what Roman does is looks at all those initiatives um, that people have taken through the ages uh, in the context of trying to imagine what futures look like. Now, I'm, I'm not one of those people who feels that I can imagine what a future looks like other than if we don't act, I can imagine 
the danger of the future that I'm putting in place for my great grandchildren and potentially great grandchildren and, and beyond. But I do think that if you took a, um, a seven generation approach in the way that many, many indigenous communities in the world have done and have always done, mm -hmm. then that seems to be the kind of sensible way to do it. We call a generation in, in Wales, by the way, 25 years. Right. Uh, for convenience. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, but I think you have to do it beyond the people you know. And you have to think about, if we think about the level of damage, you know, that since 1970, we've lost 60% of our species. Oh. I mean, it is such an extraordinary figure oh. for those of us who were in the school in the 1970s. Yeah. That's 50 years ago. If we, if that loss accelerated, then it is terrifying oh. to think what, what might be there for people born today. Yeah. Um, and I hope that that is what urges us to, <clears throat> to action. Wonderful. Now we have a question from Matt Davies, who's a colleague of mine at the IGP, and also he's a panelist, so he can ask it in person. Matt, please. Thanks, Henrietta, and uh, Dioka Bauer, Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, so. <laughs> absolutely loved your, your presentation and gave me great pride as a Welshman to hear it. Um, I, I want to pick up on your comments on the idea of a peop making the act a people's act, and, and also when Henrietta mentioned Costa Rica. So we actually use Costa Rica as a, as a really great teaching case study at the IGP with our students. And one of the dynamics we often pick out that happens in Costa Rica is the, the real way in which the Costa Rica sees its role as a leader globally on environmental issues that then instills a sense of sort of national pride. And then this plays out in public opinion surveys in the sense that Costa Rican populations will tend to support progressive policy in ways that many other, uh, uh, they won't, publics won't in many other parts of the world. And so it's this real sense in leadership around the environment and ecology that makes what enables what Costa Rica is able to do domestically, I guess. And I mean, in Wales, I always feel that we we unite and have a great sense of powerful pride in various things that we do, particularly uh, sporting prowess and our cultural prowess, etc. But when I'm down the, the the club in the valleys with uh, with various people, I don't yet get the sense that we have that pride in our leadership on these kinds of issues. And often there is a sense of pride in the environment in which we live, I think, very much, but not necessarily of our own leadership. So I was really interested to hear what you would have to say about what are the steps to turn this into a real people's act, whereby everyone in Wales is talking about it and supporting it and backing it and feeling that that same sense of pride um, because of our leadership that we feel in other aspects of Welsh culture. Um, th thank, thank you so much for that question, Matthew. I mean, I think I think um, that one of the, the core areas of this is, is that when people know about it, they do feel proud of it. Um, the issue is that people don't know about it. And I think that that, that that is starting to change. And I think it will change as more and more um, uh, public bodies are delivering on their agenda according to the principles the well-being of future generations act and they're going to need to explain to people why they're doing that um, but at the moment um, i think it would be fair to say that in some parts of wales people really know about it and in other parts of wales they have no understanding of it at all and you know some um political authorities have embraced it and others have almost tried to ignore it and in, in one sense, none of that is unexpected when you're moving from one system to another system. And I think that the, um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Commissioner, the Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie Howe, is definitely thinking about, well, where she might do a couple of interventions, uh, where that would best be done to both help an organisation that wants to move forward more effectively, but also give therefore lessons uh, to others in that in in that context because one of the things that I was very keen when I kind of proposed this was that this act was the permission to think differently it was not punitive 
because the worst thing in terms of a future generations act uh, would be uh, not to be able to engage people um, uh, in being really imaginative and in thinking completely differently. Um, and therefore I felt that at this, at this point in Wales' history, this needed to be very positive. It needed to draw people into it. And when you look at what um, the communities in Wales respond to on every single occasion about that value of community and you, and when you talk about the valleys and there was another question on the call about well, what, what enabled Wales to be progressive enough to adopt this act. In many ways, it's because Wales's history is about either being ignored or it's money taken out. You know, Wales was the first million pound check in the coal exchange. Um, Wales fueled the industrial revolution, but the money left. Um, the money left for copper, the money left for coal, the money left for steel, the money left for iron. You know, so the people of Wales have grown up as the, uh, 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 you know, serving all the interests of extraction. And the communities are often left behind, aren't they? In that context, they're left behind in valleys that when I first came to live in Wales were completely black. Um, and government tried to intervene by creating job opportunities, which weren't jobs for those people in those places. And actually one of the most exciting, um, in many ways, the most exciting proposition that's coming out of Wales at the moment in terms of that pride has been that in three of those coal mining valleys, there is a proposition whereby the community can have the land around them to the skyline, the project's called Skyline, given to them in perpetuity if they define their future according to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And that in those communities has created such excitement uh, and opportunity because those valleys are now absolutely beautiful and they're within easy traveling distance of Cardiff or, uh, and they have trains going up to them, et cetera, as well. So suddenly those old coal mining areas could have completely different futures linked to the environment that they are in. And I think it's that notion that when people start doing those kind of things and they can only do that, because the act has given permission to government and the local authority to think differently and to those people to think differently. That will be a very, very powerful lever. Some similar things are happening in some other places in Wales. In Newtown, the local government has handed over all the spare land um, to community associations looking to deliver on it according to the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So these things are starting and I think they're very exciting. Yes. Well, that's redistribution of land is deeply radical. I mean, that is very, very radical. It's absolutely radical. And I think you probably answered in part the, the, the Adrian Planteau's question about the how could Wales be so progressive when others cannot? But perhaps how do they be that radical? I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? I mean, we don't see that in England. No, but I think it's, isn't it about being a small country? I mean, in a sense, you can say that, you know, Wales, Wales was born radical. Charles oh. Yes, okay. came out, you know, <laughs> out, out of Wales. The the Chartists came out of Wales. They, mm. I mean, it's you know, Wales doesn't play by the rules of other countries. Mm. Just as England doesn't play by the rules of Wales. I mean, you mm. know, this is what elements of national identity and culture and heritage um, give you. And and mm. there are some very negative aspects. I mean, Wales has been left with huge amounts of emphysema mm. and problems linked to the extractive industries. Uh, well, huge amount of poverty of not being able to um, re-employ people in, in, in uh, jobs linked to their skills or anything post the mines, mm. etc. So there are enormous challenges for anybody who's in government in Wales. Um, but actually, it remains, I'm sure Matthew will, will tell you, incredibly strong, cohesive communities. And I think it's partly why Wales has has survived COVID very well, has been partly those communities have been everywhere in evidence in Wales in supporting each other. Mm, it's very, very interesting. And then we've got another question from um, Christopher Harker and he's saying you mentioned debt colonizing futures, mm. but what about pension schemes and the redistributions they are and will enable? Have you done any work to address issues of valuation and risk that are being used to sort of decimate these defined benefit schemes for pensions? 
Well, the, the answer is not personally, although this is an area I'm very, very interested in. Huh. Um, and there is a green actuarial movement, um, which actually looks at, at these issues, because it's absolutely extraordinary that there isn't a discounting measure that actually recognises uh, the effect of an organisation on the climate. <laughs> just extraordinary at this point in time. But what is really interesting uh, is the movements that have come through universities and others about um, uh, you know, sort of taking the divesting in the yeah. context of university funds, in the context of pension schemes and others. And, for, and, and that's happened quite substantially uh, in Wales as well. And there's a big challenge going on at the moment from a number of um, people in terms of the local authority pension schemes too. So I think that we will see, and particularly uh, in advance of COP, I think there'll be a big move, not least um, from the governments uh, in the devolved nations in terms of de-risking their local authority and other public sector pension schemes in mm -hmm. advance of the COP, because you can't declare a climate emergency and allow pension schemes to, do, to, to deliver on coal, either in this country or elsewhere. No, that's right. And that, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge issue, isn't it? So mm. what is happening in Wales about, I mean, we imagine we've talked a lot about COP and by that we mean COP26, of course, but what about COP15 and biodiversity? Is there equally work going on uh, on sort of biodiversity? Yes, the, one of the um, goals I pointed out was um, not just about um, maintaining but enhancing biodiversity. That turned out to be an incredibly important goal in one of the decisions that the First Minister of Wales made when um, the proposed M4 relief road mm. uh, around Newport in the southeast of Wales, which was going ac across very sensitive territories, very sensitive nature to territory in the Gwent levels. Um, the planning inspector's view was actually that it could go ahead. The first minister turned it down on environmental grounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a huge decision and signal and literally within a couple of weeks, he then announced that he was going to support a new Welsh national forest. And this isn't going to be in a specific location, mm -hmm. but this proposal is a Welsh national forest that connects North and South Wales. <laughs> I see. The idea of it being something that grows organically and will be given funding in due courses. It can be connected by hedgerows and others. There'll be rebuilding oh. hedgerows in some places too, but mm -hmm. literally to agroecological approaches to farming, a Welsh national forest is seen to be a really important aid in the context of biodiversity. And Iceland, the shop, not the country, yeah, not, the country. <laughs> not, not the country, because Iceland started, I don't, people may not realise, but Iceland started in Wales with a Welsh um, uh, chief, chief executive. Yeah. Iceland is funding the reparation of the Welsh peat bogs. Mm. Amazing. And that, is, that is that is also very uh, heartening, isn't it? Yes. And, and and talking about just thinking about you, be, you began with sort of Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs and mentioned that that was 1943, which is indeed a long time ago. And I was thinking about you know that's an interesting moment, the 1940s, and, and beverage is 1942, of course. Yes. And the extraordinary thing is that when beverage you know, released that report, people queued down the road in London to buy it. It actually made a profit for the government. And more than that, the BBC published, broadcast its main findings in 20 languages, right? So there was an extraordinary move, you know. And in a way, I mean, I can't work out whether this fixation we have on the middle 20th century is a good thing or a, ba or a bad thing. You know, there seems to be much there, but we seem to be always going back to that that past, but what's useful now is that it looks like Wales has got some kind of movement behind transformation, which is quite extraordinary. Yes, I think I think what um, um, what I think about that period of time in the in um, in, in immediately post war mm. is is actually there are times of crisis that give you perm permission to do things differently. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's always it always interested me that. Um, um, you know, that phrase that, that Churchill was often seen to have won the war, but he didn't win the peace. Yeah. Because 
there is a notion about the kind of skills and safety you need after um, a, an enormous crisis that requires different sorts of skills and opportunities. And it was interesting that it wasn't just, it wasn't just one party because actually in the context of the Education Act, that was already in place. Yeah. Um, and, but you had the National Health Service and my father started on the first day of the National Health Service as a doctor. <laughs> but you had the National Health Service, you had the massive period of council building and, and yeah. never better period of council building than that period um, from the wars until the, to, to the end of the fifties. Um, and so there was a real notion that, um, uh, that also because of clean water and clean air acts and all those things as well, you had a notion that population would be kept safe in all those bottom elements. Yeah. As those hierarchy of needs. Yeah. And I think governments have forgotten that. <clears throat> yeah. And therefore, because when they don't do the building, when they don't give people decent housing, then actually they, they are moved too far away from the problem to deal with it because it becomes too big. Mm. And then it gets hived off to somebody else. And then the responsibility gets hived off because actually government can't, can't deal with the misery of the people who are unable to access. And I think that we, we just need a real long, hard beverage type look yeah. where we are now. We had it on the Cathy Come Home agenda. Mm -hmm. Some of you may, like me, have seen the ITV news the other night where we saw the conditions under which some people in council properties are living yeah. southeast of England. Mm. And there is nothing worse no. than we saw people bringing up children in those environments and then expecting them to be citizens and good citizens playing their part in the UK. Yeah. So it's the big, re it must be the time for the big rethink yeah. now. And I hope that just, you know, some of the lessons from Wales are that if you take something and you stick at it, you can achieve an outcome. Mm. Now, you also say that's the same lesson from Finland in the context of education. Mm. Across a range of different governments, they stuck with the core message about how they were going to change the education system. Mm. And any country that achieves outcomes over the long term has normally done it um, with more than one party in office, in delivery as well. And yeah. in Wales, <clears throat> Uh, although Labour has always been in office, it's been in coalition with Plaid Cymru, it's been coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Um, and that's been really important in having a narrative that is beyond an individual party as well. Yes, that comes back to the question that we had about, about time. When I see, looking at the clock, which is time, I see we have just time for one more question. And Matt has, I think, won, won the prize of being able to ask another one. Matt. Uh, thank, thanks, Henrietta. I mean, I, I have loads of questions for you, Jane, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the dialogue that's, that's been going on and uh, I massively agree with so much of what you've been saying. And um, I, I, I kind of thought it might be worth finishing on something that, that's forward looking again. So we are emerging from a crisis and governments are still managing the, the exit to that crisis. The, the Welsh government uh, professes and has demonstrated in many ways its forward thinking nature. So I was wondering whether you were able to give us any insight in terms of how are the Welsh government now starting to try and get ahead of the, the game here and the curve and use this moment for that, that great pivot, that great uh, change in thinking and, and, and to, to really, to really mobilize uh, around this and whether you have any insights into that, do you think do you think there are moves already to get ahead of the game here and to use this moment for transformation? And it, part of this is my reflection on, we felt through the COVID crisis, there's almost there's been this tit for tat between Westminster and, um, and Edinburgh and Cardiff, which almost feels like these um, uh, trying to do things differently for the sake of difference almost. And I'm sure that's not actually the case. The reality is that those governments are pushing their policy making in the right ways for their populations, but it feels like the tit for tat. And so are the Welsh government actually going to get ahead of this situation because of their forward thinking? Or are we going to slip into a, a simple sort of tit for tat um, responding to each other as, the, as we gradually emerge from the situation? Uh, I don't know. Um, the answer to that. It, um, to some extent, that might depend on who the next Welsh government is post May 6th. <laughs> we, won't, we won't know that either. 
um, and, and, and until that date. But I think what, what has been interesting and um, uh, has just been looking at understanding the narrative on my home territory here in Wales, and then seeing how that's portrayed elsewhere. And I think that there was a very, um, there was a very kind of Im Im important contribution from our first minister, Mark Drakeford, on a number of occasions where he has demonstrated unequivocally that he wanted to work on a full country basis. Mm. And, um, but yet he was unable, um, uh, even when all three Celtic nations agreed, they were unable uh, to, to get the support of England in that context. And I think what we have to remember is these are unequal relationships. Because even in, even in the context of Scotland having substantially more powers than Wales, and Northern Ireland having more powers than Wales, um, none of them have the powers or authority of the UK government. Um, and in that sense, uh, it means that you're always seen to be in some sense that it's the small country that is betraying the narrative. Whereas I know that the First Minister in, in, in Wales, um, you know, was deeply concerned that there weren't more opportunities taken to try and agree that approach. Now, of course, they did come together eventually, but in many ways it's because Wales locked down as quickly as possible, as did Scotland at the beginning, in more draconian ways than England. And it took, uh, it took England a while to actually come to the table in, in that context. But what is interesting is that had there not been those different views, we might be in an even worse place now. Because my, um, you know, there's a doctor of my acquaintance who, who, who lives in England, uh, who just said, uh, if you want to know what English policy is, uh, just assume it's a week later than Scotland. <laughs> and in the early part of, the, of COVID, <clears throat> that was probably true. And that was because there was more decisive action in protection of the population taken early. And had that not been the case in the devolved nations, I'm not sure England would have taken the route it did finally take, which actually will have saved lives. Mm. So I think that actually even there, take the tit for tat out of it, just think of it as how every prime minister tries to do the best they can by their own country and must learn from what others are doing in that context as well. So even there, there is learning from each of how each of those countries acted. And that learning will come out in the context of the uh, independent review whenever, whenever that happens. So if I can leave everybody with that theme that what devolution offers, and particularly with small countries, is a chance to experiment, to change, mm to challenge received wisdom, and if creating something positive for that then to be passed on for the benefit of all. And going back to that point about not one other country in the world has legislation to support future generations. Yeah. I hope if people on this call have been convinced by the narrative, we would all want all countries to be framing their decisions in that way, because that might be the only way to address the massive biodiversity and climate problems that face us all. Mm. Wonderful, Jane. Thank you so much. We're out of time, as we always are, very quickly on these occasions. But a truly inspiring, actually very moving account of what's happened in Wales. I feel quite um, moved, very moved, in fact, by listening to this story. And so thank you for sharing it. And also thank you for all the work that, that you are doing and continue to continue to do. We loved having you at the IGP. We so hope that we can continue the conversation with you and find ways to do that. That will be a lot of fun. And we might well do around regenerative agriculture, which we're very keen on, on agroecology. So because we are a small panel, we can unmute the panel and we can give you a round of applause, which is actually very difficult to do these days. Because <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>